And I want to, uh, my name is Dustin Swain. I'm the Instructional Effectiveness Specialist for the online campus and the Center for Graduate Studies. And, and I do want to welcome you to the eighth faculty session for uh, the 2015 academic year. I'm sitting here with Phil Seeley, who I will allow to introduce herself in a second. And uh, we're getting ready to present on uh, creating good discussions in a face-to-face -face classroom. Phyllis? All right. Thank you so much, Dustin. And again, my name is Phyllis Seeley. I'm from the Owasso campus. I am the IES there. Uh, and I'm so happy to be with you. Uh, it's going to be fun. I hope all of you will participate uh, as, as often as you possibly can. So you see on the screen in front of you the objectives for today's session. And overall, what we want to facilitate is a conversation um, and some learning points on the component of having a good discussion in your classroom and how to drive that discussion through um, being cognizant of the types of questions that you're asking in your classroom and also um, by uh, to find some opportunities for um, some different types of question asking in your classroom. about um, about conversations in our classroom. Um, the quote I immediately think of is uh, the, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And I oftentimes think that this is analogous to our classroom conversations uh, because uh, discussions in our classroom begin with one question and oftentimes a good conversation is going to begin with one good question. And so as we think about conversations in our classroom and we think about asking questions, we want to ask you, why do we as individuals ask questions and why do you as instructors ask questions of your students? And think about that for a second and go ahead and share your thoughts. Why do you ask questions? Mary says uh, the same price to find out what they know. Malgor says to prompt discussion to initiate thinking, the process about the top. Good. Develop critical thinking. Excellent. Oh, folks, there's lots of you out there. <laughs> Don't be shy. Dustin, uh, um, Another thing maybe that we don't think about so much is that uh, when questions are asked, um, it, it helps students really um, retain the information when there's some active conversation around a particular concept. So, you know, maybe just that, you know, retaining uh, yeah. might be one. And I also think about um, when we ask questions, we answer questions, and oftentimes those questions will spur other questions. And have the student in the classroom that maybe doesn't jump at the opportunity to answer it, but they get to kind of see how information uh, is processed by others, and they may uh, begin to get a better understanding and uh, develop some additional thoughts. Actually, those who are a little bit nervous maybe about responding to class, if they actually hear somebody coming up with the very same ideas as they might be thinking about, it sort of validates uh, their thought processes, mm -hmm. I think. Absolutely. We have a couple people sharing some things privately. Um, you, you, uh, when you're sharing, please make sure that where it says send to, you have it to everyone. Currently, some of you are sharing just with um, Phyllis and I. But we have formative assessment, critical thinking, learning from others. Excellent. Echoing what we just said. Uh, wrong answers help further explore concepts. Oh, okay. I love Perfect. that. Uh, being wrong sometimes is the best way to become right. Uh, ask questions to get them involved. Very good. Okay, so we're we're very much on the right uh, right path with how we think about uh, the questions and how we use them. And so the next idea that we want to make sure that we we consider is uh, the question of can good or effective questions be developed on the fly? Meaning, can you walk into a classroom and ask a question and have it be a good 
Good question. Well, answer, the, the short answer is yes, but the long answer is no. When we think about questions that we ask, we want to make sure that we are being really intentional with our questions, asking, so that we can ensure that we end where we need to. And I think whenever I talk to instructors about uh, the idea of kind of word to fly or kind of responding to what's given, I always think of this family circus comic that you see here on the left, where, yeah, we get to where we need to get to, but look at the long, uh, indirect path that we need to take. And that's not what we want to, to do with our students. We want to be very direct and to make sure that we are ending right where we need to and we're not expending any additional resources to get there. Uh, we have precious few moments in our class and we, we need to take advantage of every one of those. And so we need to make sure that we are walking in with a clear direction and uh, a clear map in front of us of how we're going to achieve what we need to by the end of the class. So can questions be developed on the fly? Absolutely. Are they going to get you where you need to go? Maybe, but you may end up taking a few side trips trying to get there. And can you really afford those side trips is another question that um, we make sure that we ask. So us instructors, because we have, you know, very, you know, as I said, those precious few moments in the classroom, and we need to treat those as valuable nuggets of time, um, instructors really should be proactive about guiding classroom discussions so that we can make sure the end where we need to, focusing on those student learning objectives for the course, for that particular class or an assignment. And so instructors need to be very mindful and proactive about guiding the discussion actively. And so here are some things that instructors should do if they're going to guide the discussion. And I'm not going to read them all to you. you can uh, capable of doing that, but really making sure that we are redirecting and clearing up any misconceptions so that students, again, aren't spending resources and energy learning wrong information. Not that it's not okay to have wrong answers, but we make sure that we use those. And using students' responses as a springboard um, to additional information and discussion. And using students to elaborate in a way so that, you know, not giving just short brief one-word responses when there's so much more to be said and, you know, not letting students kind of uh, hide behind those, making sure that they're actually talking about them. And so, um, again, guiding discussion is, is something that instructors need to be very uh, ready to do, but also proactive about. And that's where that, that plan piece comes in, which is really nicely to, to this, doesn't yeah. it, Phyllis? Nice, yes, yeah. nice segue. Thank you. Um, yeah, in, in thinking about about um, the faculty growth and evaluation process, uh, one of the you know, major areas is in planning and preparation. And certainly, uh, this is exactly what Dustin was just um, um, giving us this information on how important it is to do that planning. Um, it's just actually managing your instruction time and, and doing that effectively. Um, when evaluations are um, observations are, are taking place. This is one thing that uh, we really want to see happening in the classroom uh, to, to see that the instructor is, you know, developing those uh, and, and managing those questions and in instruction time uh, effectively. And if you look at the, the, the different ratings here, we just have them up on the screen. Uh, the meets and the exceeds as far as um, how well is, uh, the instructor's transitions and um, um, preparing for those uh, different topics of, of discussion. Yeah. And know about you, Phyllis, but I know that when I go in and I see an instructor team, I can always, you know, kind of tell the difference when they're shooting from the hip and when they have a, a clear right. path ahead of them. And I'll bet the students can, too. Oh, absolutely. Hey, and um, we have done a little bit of research um, uh, and also uh, Dustin and, and I probably have had a little bit of experience in the classroom as far as designing uh, questions. And uh, this uh, Nielsen here is one of the um, researchers that we were looking at. Uh, describes, uh, as you can see on the screen, a systematic process for designing uh, questions for inquiry. And the bullets here, as you can um, your, yourself read them, uh, do the objectives or the SLOs for the course. Um, what we do is 
um, we asking ourselves a question: What do we want students to know or to be able to do as well of participating in this discussion that we're going to be holding? Another area um, he said is uh, for each of these learning outcomes, these SLs, create one or two questions, and what what we'll do is provide students with an opportunity to develop, or excuse me, to demonstrate. Uh, attainment of that SLO. Sometimes, you know, our students, we talk SLO and student learning outcome. We talk about that in class as instructors, but um, I'm not so sure students really um, are understanding exactly what that's all about. And I think if we scaffold that, let them know that, okay, this is an area that we're going to really concentrate on and um, designing, of course, your questions. Um, in the area to demonstrate for the students themselves. Oh yeah, I got that. Working backwards is another one. Um, you know, a couple questions that, after answered, will lead up to that very key question that designed for that SLO, sort of weighing into it. And of course, using Bloom's taxonomy and um, that is you know, certainly demonstrated for us in many examples in our AIM uh, professional development. Uh, I believe it was in the planning and uh, it was quality teaching and quality learning. Quality teaching and learning and yeah. curriculum really focuses yeah. on, yeah, right. definitely. So if you just refer back, there, there's all kinds of um, equals question starters um, that uh, we had, you know, provided for instructors. So. And this, um, There we go. So this this visual here is to just kind of help us frame uh, frame what Phyllis said in terms of how we how we design and think about developing those questions. And those the learning objectives that are stated in the course are always where we want to start. Um, it's interesting when I have conversations with instructors who some of them still kind of think that it is the the textbook that drives the course. And the reality is no, the textbook is a tool. The the objective that is stated that we're, we're hoping to achieve by the end of the course. That's what's driving our course. That's what's driving our conversation and, and the tools that we access. And so we always want to start with, okay, uh, as Phil said, working backwards, um, what are we trying to achieve by the end of our time together or what are we trying to achieve by the end of the course? We start there. And then we use that information, that student learning objective, to determine um, the uh, um, the level of Bloom's taxonomy that you see here on the right, the level of Bloom's taxonomy that, that we're trying to achieve through that learning objective, is this kind of objective uh, trying to get us to apply the information or is it trying to get us to analyze the information? Uh, how how complex are we trying to get? Once that's determined, we use that and we have our Bloom's taxonomy verb question and strategy document that's part of our AIM training. Um, and if you forgot about that, don't don't forget you can access it through the my um, the okay. the Micer website through the okay. effective teaching and learning section. Um, that's where all of our AIM resources are accessible. Um, so we can use that document to help us to develop questions, strategies, and design activities um, that we're going to do with students in the classroom to help them achieve uh, the learning objective. And so it kind of all comes full circle when you think about it in this way. And so that helps you frame the uh, the conversation about the different uh, strategies that you have for designing questions. All right, let's talk about a little bit about question types. Um, I believe it's really important for us to use, and instructors, to use a variety of questioning texts. Uh, some just stated here very very quickly, close-ended, open-ended, uh, et cetera. You can read those. But um, in close-ended, you know, those that naturally you, you are well aware of those that require either a yes or no response. Um, oftentimes, um, it's just like, well, maybe I shouldn't use those. But, you know, uh, Dustin and I were just talking. You know, it's okay to use any one of these four. four. Well, yeah, and I think, it, I think each one of those has a really, uh, really clear purpose, you know. Closed questions are not a bad thing. Um, it's 
you know, they have a very clear, direct answer, but that's a really good way to get students to think about or for you as the instructor to assess the Absolutely. levels of knowledge Absolutely. because we need that foundation to build on. It's a, it's a, a very quick checking. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Um, and if you can't answer the closed-ended question, are you going to be able to answer the open-ended question? Absolutely, right. Right. And then as, you know, as we go through these, I'm not going to, you know, tell on each one of these. Um, again, you know, in looking at the convergent as opposed to divergent questions, um, same thing. I mean, they both have their place, um, and they're both very valuable. Uh, certainly, if you want discussion just to really be uh, full and rich, uh, and eventually we want to get to those divergent questions. Um, learn, so students can learn from each other, and it, it encourages um, students to think more deeply. Oh, maybe, absolutely. Maybe yeah. in a way that they've never thought before. Yeah, and that's a, I mean, the convergent questions are great when we want to see them apply that information mm -hmm. in a very clear, direct path where you know, there is a, a correct way to use the information, an incorrect way. And divergent, it's it's a rare opportunity to get them to or sorry, to be able to see them apply different kinds of information uh, from different areas, but still coming up with solutions and things of that nature. So, so some characteristics of effective uh, questions to be, uh, as you can see here, meaningful and understandable. Um, students do, do need to know what it is that you're asking, and we need to state it in uh, so that they can understand. And again, I think that goes all the way back to our, maybe one of our first slides about planning. Yes. You know, those the questions, you know, maybe at the very beginning, um, and certainly with more experience, I suppose you can do things more on the fly. But even for those seasoned teachers, when I've talked to them before, how many times I've seen in their lesson plans questions, and they actually have written out those questions uh, so meaningful and, and understood by students. Uh, levels of difficulty, and you know maybe we've touched on this a little bit, um, depending on the level of comprehension of a, of a particular topic um, or concept, students might be able to handle or probably handle many different varieties or various levels. Um, but always remembering that the students should be challenged with a question, but not so that they're frustrated. And yes. that's the one thing that's important. Um, and then lastly, um, need to uh, be able to answer the easier questions, of course, before the more difficult. We don't want to shut them down. Mm -hmm. okay. Absolutely. So, um, Absolutely. those uh, questions is important. Yeah. If you walk in and start with the really difficult questions, and mm -hmm. you know, where does that leave you to go? And also, are do you honestly think that your students are going to be ready to answer those questions? Right. Yeah. So it's it's really important to scaffold and build towards that. All right. Let's talk a little bit about um, what makes them ineffective, and um, certainly. Um, um, if, if the question is too vague, if students are not sure what it is that you're you're asking, uh, again, that probably plays a little bit on what I had just talked about earlier about you know making sure that the question is well planned and thought out. Um, so be clear as to what it is that you're asking. Or you know we don't want them to be too loaded. Um, we don't want students to guess at what you want them to say. Uh, you know, we want them to, you know, actually have their own thoughts and their ideas. So, um, if it's two students are going to ask at what uh, you want them to say, rather than tell you what they actually think. Um, and then, <laughs> this is because Dustin and I just just before we went on, we're talking about the, these questions that sometimes we hear still in the classroom. Uh, instructors say, "Okay, okay does everybody understand now? Everybody." Clear any other questions, and oftentimes that questions, and, uh, and then we're baffled by the assessment we run the next day, and we're saying, "Well, no questions. Everybody seemed to understand. I don't understand that they, they, we didn't do very well on this quiz." So, it's, it's, you don't understand. I'm sorry, you don't know what no. you don't know. So right. if right. they don't know the content, they don't know the, what they know and what they don't 
don't know. Right. So I, uh, I, I caution instructors about using that. Does everyone understand or does anybody have any questions? Because I don't think it's going to give you a good, good you're going to get a good response. And then, um, oh, I'm sorry. Well, no, I was just going to say we had, um, uh, did more to say on this one? Well, I'll just that, that last one. I was just oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. About, and then the last point here was uh, yes, no questions or other closed end questions. Um, it'd be useful. Remember, we did say that um, for going on previous knowledge or to get started on a new topic. Just to you know, kind of it's, uh, the students' voice about what it is they know or don't know about it gives you an idea where they are. Um, but probably are going to be a dead end for any deep engagement or discussion. Mm -hmm. so. Before we go on to the next slide, I want to address a question that we had in the chat box from Barb Cady, and she asked, can you give us an example of convergent and divergent questions? And a really good question, uh, Barb. And I did provide uh, a couple of um, posts there to give a, a kind of a definition uh, of what those are. Um, and to kind of talk on those for a second, when we talk about convergent questions, um, not that we're asking a closed-ended yes or no question, we're still asking an open-ended question, but there's a pretty clear uh, right or wrong way to apply the information. So, for example, I'm teaching, a, I just finished teaching a, a day class, uh, Intro to Microsoft Access, one of the IF classes. And in that, we talked about some of the practices for designing good data. Databases. So, what is uh, what things that we need to make sure we have included in a good database? And it's not that there's a conclusive list. It's just that there there are concepts of what good database design should encompass or include. And so, I asked students to talk about that. There are very clear things that I'm looking for. And if those aren't mentioned, or if something else is mentioned, then they're either right or they are wrong. Um, so, they're going to be convergent, uh, ended, but still a clear right or wrong. Uh, divergent is you don't have that clarity on the response. Um, for example, if I asked students in, on, in one of the discussions, we talked about um, what happens when uh, database designers don't follow good database design rules. Um, and it's not that there is, it's an open question, but there is no clear right or wrong because the the conversation can go in a multitude of directions, and any number of things could happen. And it could go into uh, security breakdowns. It could go into usability breakdowns and things of that nature. And so that's the difference between convergent and divergent. I also had a question. I um, came over privately um, from Maurice, but he asked, how does closed-ended question become both ineffective as well as relevant given the previous discussion? Um, Maurice, can you clarify what you what you're asking there? Your uh, microphone and chat with us, or you can type it in there. Well, we're gonna, he might get back with Yeah, if you, if you go ahead and post, we'll respond. I'm not 100% sure what you're asking there in the question. Um, I do get that you're asking about how, how maybe misspoke and we're referring to closed-ended being effective and ineffective. Um, I think I, think I kind of get it. Um, I, I think I get it. What you're asking. We we are referring to it as both. Um, they can be effective, but um, I what we're saying it is a question type, and it can be used effectively. Um, however, it, it sh when we talk about conversations and questions, it she we're looking we're advocating for a variety of question types. And if an instructor is solely asking um, yes or no questions, which sometimes happens, um, 
it doesn't do anything to help develop the discussion or the conversation. It, it, it keeps things short and cut off, and it doesn't develop. Right. So when we talk about um, having quality or, or good conversations in the classroom or discussions, we, uh, we don't, uh, I'm sorry, a good conversation isn't going to be brief and direct. It's going to kind of develop. Yes, questions is a way to begin that foundation for you to assess and for students themselves to understand what they know and what they don't know. Um, but you need to then develop it organically into other types of questions. Right. I mean, just remembering, just thinking about that blue taxonomy. Absolutely. I mean, that, yeah, the, going back yeah, to that. We want to get uh, as far up on that as that. Yeah, and you're not going to get very far up that with no. yes or no questions. But you know, if you still have something else, you know, please feel free to uh, chat about that. Some some different strategies, and this is where we want to kind of turn it out to our audience. Um, we have the strategies for discussion listed here: debate, think, pair, share, etc. Um, have you used any of these in your classrooms? And if so, what has been your experience? And you know, give us some positives and negatives. That are listed. Yeah, absolutely. That way. Yeah, things that maybe you tried that didn't work out the way you wanted to, but these were strategies that we uh, that we saw, that you likely saw during our AIM training. Um, and so I know that some of you have known about these strategies for a while, and we're hoping to hear about some that have given them a shot. Oh, we have one from Kathy, uh, case studies. Uh, she's saying it works very well. Um, what, class are, what course is that, Kathy? Probably um, let's use case studies there. Yeah. How do they? Uh, I mean, can you, Kathy? Can you elaborate a little bit on how they help with the conversation of the classroom? A phenomenal teaching tool, but how do they impact the discussion? They shared, uh, but he should have privately that group discussions work well. Excellent. So Kathy did respond um, as far as in the health science helps apply to the clinical setting. Very good. Connecting classroom to real world experience. Oh, excellent. Yeah. So yeah. ask Kathy, do um, when you talk about using case studies, do you bring in a case study for the class to discuss? Or do students bring in experiences? Or both. Okay. Very, very cool. cool. Very, very relevant then. Yes. Excellent. Anybody uh, using debate? Something really interesting to um, um, just to look at the different trains of thought. And what's even more fun and interesting, I think, is to put somebody on the other side, even though they may have. Um, yeah. Um, really. You know, one way of thinking, you know, just to try to. Help them. End of it. So the other strategies that we have up here, uh, certainly, I'm, I'm sure you have. Um, yeah. Discussion strategies. And that we're, yeah, we're we're focusing. Uh, there are lots of great strategies for lots of great things, but we want to make sure that we're focusing on the conversation piece, the discussion piece. Um, down that hands-on works well in technical classes. Darrell, can you address? Can you talk about how does hands-on work? in terms of discussion in your classroom? Mm -hmm. And then uh, Ernest has shared that they do a uh, small group in the accounting class as well. That's excellent. Uh, so, uh, as I give a forum that has a process and steps to complete a task. Okay, excellent. All right, very good uh, examples of different strategies. Has any tried any discussion strategies that haven't worked out so well? Gives the example of configuring a network card, talking through that process. Lab activities, saying that lab activities have not worked well?
Okay. Uh, Maurice has said the use of buzzers synonymous with a game show provides a sense of motivation for students as it relates to understanding of the concepts presented. Okay. Now, when you, you facilitate something like that, are you are you doing open ended or closed ended questions? Are you talking a uh, kind of a uh, rapid fire review type session or? Um, Maybe multiple choice, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is great. Um, I would wager. I gotta ask, how does that impact classroom discussion, though? Think about how a bunch of closed-ended questions doesn't do much to develop the conversation. And it's an awesome classroom activity as you're uh, reviewing, but. Um, um, worry that that type of activity doesn't do a whole lot to to develop a, a conversation within the classroom. Excellent. Oh, Following great. up the game with a conversation. That, that's that's excellent. Very good. Very good. Okay. If you have additional strategies, feel free to continue to share. Uh, but in the meantime, Phyllis, why don't you talk about uh, with us some strategies? For facilitation. Alrighty. We've got a, a few bulleted items here. Uh, developing your questions uh, beforehand, and again, I know we've mentioned that earlier. Um, not be writing them in, in your lesson plan or in your own notes, but sometimes just putting them up on the board um, for uh, the the class to see, students to see. Uh, get them a yeah, like a direction, mm -hmm. where I'm going, where we're going today. Um, and students can write about a question or an idea for a few minutes. Sometimes that, just those few minutes that you give students, you get an opportunity to get their thoughts together. Um, there are, of course, students that can just, you know, rat, rat, you know do well with uh, quick answers. And uh, then there are students who are very, very um, I mean, they have a lot to offer, but maybe a little time to get their thoughts together. Mm -hmm. So getting them to write about it for a few minutes um, increases the chances that maybe everyone in the class will have a chance to contribute. And um, the fact that they've had an idea to get their thoughts out on paper and exactly. analyze them before they talk about them. Right. A lot of students are worried that they're going to say the wrong thing. Oh, absolutely. And so that kind of helps take that it's fear away. It down, mm -hmm. right, right. Um, maybe assigned to small groups. Uh, to work out. Again, uh, those are the ones that maybe don't, that interview, introvert student um, who has, you know, difficulty speaking in front of 30 people might very easily be able to speak in front of two or three people. Mm -hmm. And so that might be um, a strategy for that uh, particular person. What can be given as part of a previous class homework assignment? Uh, which is also giving students a chance to get their thoughts together, um, and they might be able to, you know, participate more fully in the discussion. Um, with a, a resource that we were looking at, uh, facilitating discussion, a brief guide by Gooch Talk. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and I want to just, just, just real quickly, something that she had said. If you've chosen readings that set out a, excuse me, set a debate, you and your students will start with the advantage of having an issue to consider. But if readings, like, you know, maybe you gave them a reading the night before to read or, or earlier that week. But if this reading um, is, uh, is purely informative or if they present only one side of an issue, you're saying you may have trouble finding good discussion material. So for you know a paradox, a dilemma, uh, a contradiction between two thinkers on a subject. Um, you know issues in your own field that warrant discussion. Make sure that you give your students suitable material for genuine discussions. So I just I think what she's trying to say is is make sure that our students start with an advantage, uh, especially if you're doing the debate, um, so they can maybe read about both sides and then. All right, another area, um, Ed posed a question, 
Uh, here's the really tough one. Wait. And uh, it just seems like an eternity, doesn't it? That, oh, it that does. dead space. <laughs> and but, but I and I I'll tell you, I taught for several years, and it's still very difficult for me. It's probably one of the hardest things for me to do is that that dead space. You know, I think it's not only for you as an instructor to learn to be able to cope with that, but it's good for students to know that it's okay mm-hmm. to, to wait and to have that, that dead space because it is it's giving everybody an opportunity to. Um, to think about, you know, to get their answers organized, uh, or at least their opinions uh, organized. And it also lets them know that, geez, everybody's thinking. It's not just me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're all we're all needing a little bit of time. Okay. Um, and then so well, some strategies for discussion facilitation. We also want to think about kind of some norms that we have. I always encourage instructors that when you are trying to develop a, a classroom environment in which students feel really supported and safe, that you discuss norms with them, you know, not just expectations, but behavioral expectations. Um, so these are kind of some some norms for instructors to follow to help develop that, that safe, comfortable learning environment. And so, um, first of all, model, model, model. Uh, instructors need to model the behavior that they want from their students. And so uh, you instructor giving wait time, hear everybody out, not cutting people off, um, and making that eye contact and having that interaction is a really great place to start. Watch for clues from the other students that you know maybe they have something to say, maybe that they, they want to participate. But also watching for the clues from the student who too much, you know, that, that always wants to respond to every question. Uh, you can almost see them jump out of their chair ready to respond, and maybe that's an opportunity for you as the instructor to give them a cue, to, you know, sit back, calm down, and let someone else talk for a change. Um, leads us to our next one of preventing one or a few students from monopolizing the discussion. You don't want the class to become about one or two students' philosophies. Um, if students respond with an incorrect answer, if responses are opportunities, it's they are springboards to go into a deeper conversation about the correct answer. But actually respond to that student, letting them know that they're incorrect. And that's really important. It's so hard, but it's so important that they know that they, you know, just missed the mark a little bit. But that's okay because, uh, first of all, you're in a class to learn uh, whatever the content is, and so if they knew it, they wouldn't need the class. But of all, that we all are going to say the wrong thing. We all are going to make mistakes, and uh, get them to understand that that's an important thing and that that's part of the process. And I, I just want to add something, Dustin. And you know, right from the first day of class, that's why it's important to establish that environment that is safe for for students, so that, that they make that mistake. And not feel they're to be ridiculed by a classmate or by the instructor. Um, so I think right from the get-go, part of your class management is establishing that safe environment so everybody in the class knows that um, it'd be okay to make a mistake. Oh, we all learn that mistake because who knows? Maybe five people were thinking just like Molly, for example. Uh, and they have been down the wrong track, but at least, you know, we're gently bringing her back, and everybody's fine with that. And all times, students can help each other with that. Oh, absolutely. During that absolutely. discussion, they can. Um, and turning it back over to the right. students, saying, you know, what do you guys, what do you guys think about what she right. said, or you know, um, and you know, I always tell students from the very beginning that if I only said the correct answer, I would never speak. <laughs> Most of what I say is the wrong answer, but it starts the conversation so that we can find the right answer. Right. Right. Um, and the last bullet there is we want to make sure that they understand that disagreements are actually okay. They're a good thing um, because it helps us chew on the topic. It helps us dig deeper into it. And you know, if you go back to those uh, that strategies that we want to know what people would try and fill out, if you discuss debate, and d- debate is a disagreement, but it's a disagreement that's on topic, a disagreement that is uh, supported with facts and details. 
and it is good. It's actually a, a good academic strategy to disagree, but the thing is to keep everything on topic and to make sure that no one feels threatened or attacked during the disagreement, that the ideas are on the table, not the individuals. And so those are just some, some norms that instructors should keep in mind, but then also that somehow should be presented to the students. All right. Wrapping everything up, um, important um, that end of the discussion be as important as beginning it. And, uh, one of our resource people, I, I, we like this quote, like an essay, a fine discussion should come to a fine ending. And I, I believe that's really, really important. And sometimes we may just kind of forget that or it doesn't occur to us. Um, it's in that um, you, as the instructor, um, end class, not the students start packing up their stuff and ending the class. And not, so that that means you, as an instructor, need to keep active time. And um, even the right. students, but the clock. Don't let the clock end your class. Make sure that you are you and the clock are on the same page. You're going to end when you're supposed to, but you're also going to wrap up that conversation in a nice, neat little package. Exactly. So keeping track of time and build it into your discussion strategy so that you can edit well um, is, is real important. Now, just wrapping up um, discussion if we go to the next slide. Okay. Um, to lead discussion to a conclusion, some things that maybe we should think about. Um, so not to just say, well, that was a nice discussion. See you all on Wednesday. Yes. <laughs> like, what, what just happened here? So it's important that, again, your, your time management allows you time to review the main ideas of the discussion. Mm -hmm. Not just maybe you. Uh, you know, students can review that. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So the, the, you, you're feeling good then, too. If they can wrap it up, if they can pull this together, then you know probably this is a pretty positive discussion that happened. Do you have any conclusions um, that the discussion, you know, produced? Uh, part of probably reviewing the um, access, the effectiveness of the discussion. Or I'm not saying that access, I'm sorry, assess the effectiveness of the discussion. Um, how did it go? Um, what do you think? Did, did most of my students contribute? Um, was it, you know, really... Um, uh, a, a really integrating discussion. Uh, that I have to kind of pull things out. I guess those are some things to think about. Ask students to write you a brief note. I think that's kind of neat. I, uh, uh, I started. I just started to do that probably about the last couple of years of uh, uh, when I'm teaching because um, I didn't think about that before. So again, it gives them a little time to. Um, thoughts together. Uh, it gives you, a, and also that is a great piece of information for you. Um, and then you just, you know, pull them as they leave. And you notice um, these things may take a while. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you're going to just give yourself a minute or two at the end of the You might be maybe want to think more like, what, 10 minutes? Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're honestly going to go through these, make sure... I mean, mm -hmm. students need to review. They need to uh, kind of develop a conclusion, and they need to have you help, help them put all the pieces together. So, you know, what have we talked about, and you know, what does that mean? And I think that leads to the to that second uh, major point. There is to reflect on the discussion. Um, not only is, is the discussion about the content important, but reflecting on the discussion itself. That's a really important part of learning, and that is when we kind of uh, learn. Okay, well. Well, how do I store this information, and how do I connect it to other things? And where was I in the beginning of this process, and where am I now at the other side of it? Have I learned? Have I changed? Have I grown? Mm -hmm. You know, just so just looking at the tone of the discussion, I think that's really important. Um, was it helpful? at some place you're not? Maybe you have to work on that a little bit mm -hmm. with this group. Now yourselves, you have classes, uh, you know, different classes will come to you as a ton of different personalities, and some classes can be very respectful, and um, even when there's, you know, maybe a real heated debate, but 
a lot of respect being shown. Others may, may not so much that way. So I think it's important that you just take a look at the tone uh, as well. Um, did you accomplish the goals that you established? And again, that's all part of that planning and mm -hmm. management. Uh, what is it exactly? What SLOs did you, uh, were you planning on um, time or uh, completing? Ask your students for that. Uh, again, very important. And it's good for them to start looking at experiences and evaluating them. Absolutely. All part of their Absolutely. Growth. And it also brings them in as a, mm -hmm. as a stakeholder. They feel that they have Right. A voice, but also, you know, we care about their feedback. We want to know so that we can improve ourselves. Um, Ernie shared that I have used discussion boards to follow up mm -hmm. on a class discussion and before the class uh, just to get students to think about a topic. Well, right. Ernest, thank right. you for sharing that because that is a great segue into the next component of our mm -hmm. presentation. Uh, because as you all know, we have, everyone should be using the discussion board. Uh, in Blackboard, uh, as part of our um, uh, Blackboard professional expectations, expectations that we all uh, are uh, that we are all now working to meet, and so we kind of want to think about well, how does a classroom discussion merge to the discussion board? So how do we go from that face-to-face -face component to the asynchronous online component? And Ernest really pointed out um, a great strategy. And one of the things that I, I want to kind of point out is that while the platform is different, the tactics are really the same. There isn't a huge difference um, between a, the in-class conversation and the on conversation. And so two really great strategies for taking this type of activity and moving it to um, the online discussion board is exactly what Ernest pointed out, that we can use them um, to the conversations uh, prior to class. We can use those discussion boards to get the ball rolling, to build that foundational knowledge, to get students to begin talking about the content, um, into topics that will be discussed and, um, by posting pre-discussion questions. So getting the conversation started so that you're not starting out the class at those lower levels. You've already established all that. So when you get into class, the conversation and the discussion can be focused on the analyzing and the applying and the evaluating and the creating of the Bloom's taxonomy. Another idea is to continue the, the discussion after class. If you get into a really deep discussion in class, take it then to the discussion board. Have follow-up thoughts on the discussion board or post for the students. You know, after they've had time to really reflect and to think and to, and to chew on what you discussed in the class, we we'll give them an opportunity to keep discussing, but at a much um, higher level, a much more complex mm -hmm. level. Absolutely. Um, so aim for those higher levels of the Bloom's taxonomy on the discussion board. Uh, keep up the momentum. The One of my favorite things about utilizing um, boards in conjunction with a face-to-face -face class, is you are breaking the learning for that class out of that, you know, three-hour model. You are extending it, and you're bridging that gap between class meetings. And so, yeah, we're not going to meet for another week, but that doesn't mean that our together is done. That doesn't mean that the conversation stops. It just takes a different form in the meantime, fills in the space. Mm -hmm. And also, it allows you the opportunity to link other uh, class meeting information. So, you know, you know, uh, maybe there was something that was discussed a couple weeks ago, and then you um, discussion board at class, and you ask students to take in the night's information, information that was presented from the class meeting from two weeks ago. And so there are additional opportunities. And so um, while this presentation has been on those face, uh, sorry, been focused on that face-to-face -face classroom discussion, by all means, there is the extension piece here of taking it to the discussion boards in the asynchronous format. Um, and rules have, the rules don't change when we do that. Everything that Phyllis and I have discussed uh, is still very applicable on uh, the Blackboard discussion board. Absolutely. I had an instructor stop by my office the other day and um, very excited. Um, 
because he said we we were having such a great discussion, a very um, in big discussion on a, on a very popular topic, and um, he he said you know I just hated it to to see the class come to an end. He's like kept looking at the clock, knowing that you know oh my gosh, and we haven't had a chance to close this, and he said we we shouldn't. And so he just continued it right in uh, on discussion for it, and you know, oh, that's um, cool. kind of informed the students what would be happening. And he says, and it's, it was still very, very good on the discussion board as well. So that's those are good things to hear. And um, not only that, but when you take it to this, the discussion board allows the opportunity for the students to bring additional resources. Oh, absolutely. Maybe yeah. there is a video that can keep the conversation going, or offer different viewpoints and things right, of that nature. Right. So right. it. You know, different, but it also allows for so many different opportunities. And the students loved it. They really enjoyed that another format. Mm -hmm. uh, they thought that was uh, very, very good. So, um, so we uh, we have five minutes left, and we we have re reached the end of the presentation component. And so we want to open it up to any uh, questions you may have or additional comments. You can add them to the chat box or unmute your microphone and and share. And speak with us. Yeah, don't be as well. Some of you have some great, great ideas. Here's one. Let me. Is there, uh, we have a, a question. Is there a strategy to politely convey to a student who always wants to contribute to the discussion how to be cognizant of someone else who wants to contribute without causing the students to be active the next time? Uh, really good question. And so that becomes that. That, um, becomes your role as the, the facilitator of the discussion, um, making sure that everybody gets air time. And so a couple of things that I would recommend, and Phyllis may mm -hmm. have additional recommendations too, is one, um, to establish those norms at the beginning of class, you know, that we don't want people who have the air time within class. We want to make sure that everybody who wants to speak gets an opportunity, and so we need to, um, uh, to be mindful of that. But then also that you as the instructor looking for those clues and maybe maybe you kinda have to go old school in the sense that let's let's raise our hands before we speak and you know um so when they facilitate classroom discussion sometimes students get the hand asking them to wait a second and I'll ask someone else to or as we wrap up um or you know maybe you're not even using hands as a normal thing but as some be begins to speak, you may stop them and say, hey, you know what, John, I'm, I'm going to ask you to hold on to that thought because I see that Bob over there has, has an yeah, idea. Great. Yeah, that, that's a good suggestion uh, of trying to use the that comments to put the discussion back into the class, um, maybe with something like you've written really important points, uh, John, but you know, maybe there are some others that would like to comment, mm -hmm. you know, that way. You know, you're kind of asking him just to kind of hold it for just a moment uh, and see him, you know, first complimented him for his contribution um, and that he's raised some very good points. But let somebody else here um, might, might comment. Oh. Uh, sometimes that, that's one other way of doing that. Or or sometimes the questions might, you know, like you're giving a lot of time to one student and you just, you can put them off. You can see, you know, that idea probably needs a lot more time than, than I have right now. Uh, or maybe we can discuss this after class or, yep. you know, something like that. So you're yep. not shutting him down and making him, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And sometimes you, you do have to find those polite ways to cut people off and mm -hmm. say, you know, thank you. Um, but we want to make sure that others have time as well. Right. So, right. Um, so that answered a little bit? Yeah, hopefully that gave you some, some ideas on how you can work with that in your own classroom. Yeah, it, it, it's a fine, it, it's a balance between mm -hmm. um, getting them to be succinct and getting others class time without shutting them down. Because you don't want to shut them down. You want the conversation to continue. Any uh, ideas or questions or idea? Uh, okay. Yeah, just said thanks. Uh -huh. So I'm glad that worked. Well, are uh, maybe adding their questions or comments to the to the. Chat. 
box. Uh, this is Phyllis I's uh, contact information. Feel free to reach out to us um, if you have any additional questions or uh, you want to chat about facilitating discussions within your own classroom. We're both very passionate about this idea, and we love helping um, helping faculty members generate ideas about uh, how to facilitate discussion in their own room. Uh, another question, what is your recommendation for addressing sidebar conversations? So by sidebar conversations, are you, uh, are you referring to people chatting conversations going on? Okay, are you talking whole group or small group? So a group that's getting off topic. So uh, while you're doing the small group conversations, are you rotating around the classroom? Yeah, because sometimes your just your physical presence yeah. in that little sidebar in, uh, makes a big difference. In K twelve world, we refer to this as proximity control. <laughs> but right. when we see students that are getting off topic, just Swooping and kind of being in the area will help them realize what they're supposed to be doing because, oops, the teacher's present. So right. don't be while while we work with adults, don't be afraid to be the teacher mm -hmm. and to step in and maybe maybe right. way, the way I usually work it is I will become uh, the environment. I I rotate while the small group conversations are going on. And if I have a group getting off topic, and I will tell you that I work with a lot of adults, I do a lot of training, and adults are no better than children when it comes <laughs> to staying on topic. We actually tend to have more things to talk about. Um, but I will listen for a minute, and then I will maybe ask a question that will get the group back on topic, and say, oh, sometimes I have to say, that sounds really interesting. However, remember that we're talking about this. So, so let's get back on cue. Right. Again, I, I just very quickly, um, I think I covered this just at the very beginning. It's so important that first day or week to establish your your policies, your rules, your routines, your procedures. Absolutely, those norms. And, and reminding them uh, how this class is going to be run. Yeah. And, and you need to stick to your guns. Yeah. Uh, but again, if students aren't well aware of, of our expectations, um, you know, mm -hmm. sidebar or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but and, just reminding. And always do things in a friendly and a professional mm -hmm. manner. We never want to scold adults. We never want to uh, have an attitude because, you know, that's going to inspire them to have an attitude with right. you. And role modeling. It, it, absolutely, right. absolutely. Yeah. And you don't want to lose control of that. So that gives you some uh, some assistance when you have that situation. I, too, is, is on uh, some of our, I don't know, for pop it up or not, but, you know, it's very busy, but like Doug said, we've got a, a ton of resources. Uh, please don't forget Baker College Effective Teaching and Learning site is loaded full of uh, great ideas. So, absolutely, um, absolutely. Um, not yeah. that these others are important, they are too, but we, know, yeah. we have our own uh, amazing um, resource to so make sure that you uh, visit. If you haven't been to the Effective Teaching and Learning site, um, so I can I can demonstrate very quickly how to get there in case we have we well at ten o'clock. So okay. if, if any if anybody needs to go, feel free to to sign off. Um, but for anyone who 